The solution does not have to involve government intervention, although it could. And it does not have to improve women's bargaining skills. And it does not have to improve women's desire or ability to compete. And it need not make more, men more responsible in the home, although that wouldn't hurt. <laughs> but it must involve changes in the labor market, in particular how jobs are structured and how jobs are remunerated. It must do that to enhance what I call temporal flexibility. And temporal flexibility means that you're flexible in terms of when you work. So if you want to work or you are supposed to work seven hours a day, but you want to work them in the evening, then that would be okay. It must involve a decrease in the cost to firms of substituting the hours of one worker for another. The gender gap in pay, and I mean per unit time, you always have to divide by some units of time, would vanish if firms didn't have an incentive to pay an employee who worked 80 hours a week more than two times what an employee working 40 hours a week earns. And that would be similarly with regard to working particular hours. Such change has begun in various sectors, including occupations in technology and in science and many in health. But change has been a lot slower in the corporate, financial, and legal worlds. These changes must involve a decrease in the cost of having workers substitute for each other, possibly in teams, and in having employees hand off clients. Let me make this perfectly clear because I've been misinterpreted too often. I am not saying that the last chapter would be that we would tell firms or regulate firms that they had to do the things that I'm speaking about. That won't work. It's a Band-Aid. Every year, Forbes or Fortune publishes a list of firms that have, quote, family-friendly policies. That's really nice. I applaud them. That's really good. It makes me feel warm and fuzzy. The problem is, how much does it cost the employees? If the costs of doing this do not decline, then the workers will bear the brunt of them. So the important point here is that what I'm going to speak to is how it is the costs are going to change. So the last chapter, therefore, must have a lower cost of temporal flexibility, which is an amenity that is valued relatively more by women than by men. It is valued by a lot of men. It's just relative. And it must, therefore, involve, in the end, what I call greater linearity of total earnings with respect to hours. And that's the point that I made before, that if hiring two workers, each of whom works 35 hours a week, is equivalent to hiring one worker who works 70 hours, that's linearity. If it isn't, if you get more as a firm by having someone who works really long hours, then that causes a nonlinearity or a convexity. That's the problem. But I've gotten a bit ahead of myself, and I must first discuss in brief the previous figurative chapters of the grand gender convergence before I get to the last. So there has been a great narrowing between the human capital attributes of men and women during the past century. For example, labor force participation rates between men and women have greatly converged. Time out of the labor force has decreased for most women. Years of education have surpassed those of men. This is a very big deal. This has been going on in terms of college graduation rates since 1980. College majors are far more equal between men and women and in many professions, women are more than half the graduates. That's true in that's about half in law, it's about half in medicine, it's more than half in many 
of the health fields like optometry and pharmacy, as we'll see at the end of my talk. What about earnings differences on which my talk will largely focus? Well, here you can see that there has been a narrowing, particularly in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, but there is not equality. Because of the grand gender convergence in human capital differences, what we think of as the residual gender earnings gap is now about equal to the raw difference, particularly for college graduates. And what I mean by that is most of the difference in the attributes of individuals has been squeezed out. It used to be decades ago that if we saw that men and women were earning different amounts, we'd say, oh, it's because the women had different college majors, or the women didn't graduate from college, or the women took a lot more time out of the labor force, a lot more time. They didn't have as much experience. So we'd correct for these things, and we'd take the raw difference in earnings, we'd squeeze out a certain amount, and we'd be left with the residual. But now, because the human capital attributes are so similar, we can't squeeze out anything. The raw difference and the residual difference are about the same. So I have a, I have a problem here. I have a mystery. What will be in the last chapter? It's a detective story, and therefore, I pose the question to the greatest detective of all times. And the answer that I get is a usual Holmesian point. He says, it is a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. Good point. Insensibly, one begins to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. So the question that I pose to the detective is, what's left? What will it take to eliminate gender differences in earnings? What must be in the last chapter for it to be the last? And Holmes tells me, give me some data, and then I will let you come up with a theory. So I'm going to give Holmes some data, and then we're going to do a little bit of theory, and then we're going to see whether we've come up with the answer. So the clues for the detective. So the first thing is I'm going to demonstrate that the gender pay gap, given time worked, greatly increases with the age of the individuals. And that is mainly as women and men have kids. I'm going to also show that the gender pay gap differs enormously by occupation and by sector. Although my evidence is going to be entirely for the United States. The main facts and findings can be extended to most other developed nations. So the first thing is that I'm going to first consider pay gaps among college graduates born, as you can see here, from 1958 to 1978. Along the horizontal axis is age. Along the vertical axis is the gender gap. And because I'm measuring the gender gap as the log of a ratio, if it's less than one, it's going to be negative. But because most of you do not yet have the exponential chip built into your brain, <laughs> I have uh, exponentiated it for you. And you can see that minus 0.1, then that the log of 0.9 is minus 0.1, and et cetera, so that, for example, if the gender gap, the log here of the ratio is minus 0.4, that's equal to 0.67. So the data for each, and each of those lines is for a birth cohort. The data for each cohort are the coefficients on the interaction of female and age group from cross-section regressions using the American Community Survey and the U.S. population census from 1970, that's the decennial census from 1970 to 2000. So behind this are many, many million data points. The points here that I connect are done so to produce the relationship between age and the gender pay gap for what I call synthetic cohorts. 
You can just think of these as cohorts. Note first that there is a decreasing pay gap across cohorts. That is, each of these lines for the younger cohorts is above the next. But more important to my story is that there is a greatly increasing gap within cohorts. So males and females, and you'll see this later when I discuss MBAs and, and JDs, begin their lives with pretty equal earnings per unit time. But as they age, as they form families, have kids, women's earnings fall far behind men. Now, I can add some of the older cohorts, and the gap widens even more for them. And then it turns up, but that's another story, and not one that I'm going to talk about here. Thus, the first clue that I give to the detective is that the gender pay gap greatly widens with age. A second group of clues comes from estimating gender earnings gaps by occupation. But before I present this information, I need to tell you that occupation really matters in terms of the gender pay gap. I'm going to use occupations here at the three-digit level. And what I'm going to show you is that the difference between male and female earnings is not so much where women are in terms of their occupations and where men are in terms of their occupations, but how much they get paid within these broad occupations. Even though I call them broad, there are 469 of them, which is quite a lot. Among college graduates, about somewhere around 70% of the gender pay gap is due to the gap within occupations, and only about 30% about is due to the distribution of occupations by sex. For all individuals, it's more like 85% is due to the gap within occupations, and only about 15% is due to the gap of the distribution of occupations. I just want to show you why that's the case, just so that, because this is it's the statement that I just made. I think for some of you, you say, oh, but I didn't think that that was it. I thought that it was the distribution of occupations. So this is everyone in the American Community Survey, full-time, full-year workers. On the horizontal axis is the fraction female. Each of these dots is a separate occupation. The blue dots are the occupation, um, the men, the average for the men in the occupation, and the red dots is the average for the women in the occupation. And what I simply want to show you is the vertical axis here is earnings in log terms, and I just want you to see that there's almost no relationship between fraction female and these earnings. It's a slight relationship. And as I said before, if you use these data, you'd come up with the fact that only 85%, that 85% of this difference is due to what's going on within occupations. Only 15% uh, is, is because of the distribution. And this is for college graduates. It has more of a slope. Now, now that I have convinced you, or I have imposed upon you, because no one here is raising their hand and saying, I don't believe you, <laughs> we'll have a Q&A later. Now that I hope I've convinced you that it's what's going on within occupations, let's look at within occupations. And so what I have here is a diagram that I'm going to populate. Once again, the vertical axis is this. Um, uh, is essentially the log of female over male earnings within occupation. And on the horizontal axis is the log of the male wage. And once again, because you know we don't quite understand what the log of what is equal to 11, it turns out that 11 is 60,000, uh, 12 is 160,000, and so on. The reason I, I'm noting that is that I'm going to be using occupations that are above 60,000 a year. And I'm going to populate this figure with coefficients on female 
for the 469 three-digit occupations in the American Community Survey. And they're going to be graphed against the average male income for each occupation. And the coefficients come from a log annual earnings regression for males and females who are 25 to 64 years old, who are working full-time, full year. Full-time is 35 hours or more. I include age in as a, 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 a correlate. It's actually age in a cortex, so it's age squared, age cubed, and age to the fourth. Uh, education, log hours, and log weeks. I include all the occupation dummies, and then I interact the occupation dummies with female, and what I'm going to put here is that interaction. So what you see here, this is for all occupations, and it just looks like a bad case of measles, right? Doesn't look like anything. You can squint at it, do whatever you want with it. It's not going to tell you very much of a story. But once I classify the occupations into those in the business sector, health, science, technology, and other categories, it's going to look a lot more interesting. And it's also going to look a lot more interesting if I look at occupations that I can classify. They're the ones in the professional service sector. And those are the ones I said that are approximately above 60,000 a year. And here they are. So the red squares are the ones that are in business or finance. The triangles, there are green ones. I don't know if you can tell out there the difference between green and orange. But the green ones are in technology, and the orange ones are in, are in science. Then there are a bunch of other ones that are gray circles, and health are blue triangles. So this categorization, I said, can be more easily done for those individuals with incomes, annual incomes of above 60,000. Remember, these are full-time, full-year workers. And these are often called professional service workers. And I'll give you a sense of what they are in a moment. You can see more clearly here that there really are large differences. So I think you can see there that the red squares are generally low. What that means is that for a given level of income, the gender gap within that occupation is really large. The closer these numbers get to that zero line is the closer that they come to gender equality. And you can see here that if I take out everything except for the triangles, which are the tech and the science occupations, these look like they have, they have the smallest gender gaps. With the exception, there's one outlier, and that's that dude down there. And he's a, an airline pilot. <laughs> so gender gaps, let me put back all of them again. Uh, the gender gaps in health, which are the blue diamonds, are spread out a lot. And they're going to depend to some degree on self-ownership and some other factors that I'll get to. Examples of some of the occupations can be seen here. So you can see that a lot of the tech occupations have words like engineering in them. Uh, the um, uh, the uh, business ones are things that have words like financial in them. Uh, and the, um, uh, and the uh, ones in health are the usual ones like dentists and physicians and veterinarians. And up there, is one that I'll talk about in a moment, which are pharmacists. And you can also see lawyers and judges or one of the other group. So an important piece of evidence to the getting to the answer to the question that I posed, what must be in the last chapter, is that there is a really large difference in the residual gender pay gap by occupation. So the question is, why is there such a big difference? So a really interesting hint to this and to what must be in the last chapter comes from freeing up the coefficient on hours by occupation. The regression that I used to get these coefficients did not allow hours above and equal to 35 a week to affect earnings differently by occupation. It just, there's just one. Uh, covariate in there for log of hours. 
But when I do allow this to change, and I'm going to walk you through what this diagram is, when I do allow them to change, I see that the business occupations have the greatest coefficient on log hours and the tech occupations the smallest. What this means is that the business occupations have the greatest elasticities of earnings with respect to hours and the tech, science, and the health occupations the smallest. So in this diagram, the horizontal axis is my computation of this thing called the elasticity of annual earnings with respect to weekly hours. Now, let me say that when you estimate this, the estimation is always going to be biased downward. My point is that if this elasticity is large, the larger it is, the more it is that firms are paying workers who work 70 hours a week more than twice what they pay two workers, each working 35 hours a week. That's what this elasticity shows. So it's telling us something here that I began with as a supposition and in saying that it's probably right, that occupations with the gender gap is the highest in the business and financial banking sectors are the ones that have this very large elasticity in which firms are paying workers a lot more if they're working very long hours. So a summary of the data clues here, two big ones, well three, is that earnings gaps rise with age, possibly to some point, that earnings gaps differ by occupation and by sector, that's what I just pointed to, and that hours matter differently by occupation and sector. This is enough. Holmes would say to me, you have enough information to step back from your evidence and theorize and think about what could be going on and then use that abstraction, that theory, to answer the big question. So the framework that I'm going to provide explores what happens when employees cannot easily hand off clients, patients, customers, students, whatever, in a costless fashion. That is, you're an accountant, you're sitting there with a client, it's 11 o'clock, you need to go home because your kid has a dentist appointment, and you say to your client, no problem, because Ethel is going to take over, and your client says, Ethel? <laughs> I don't know Ethel from a can of beans. Ethel is not your perfect substitute, and therefore, I'm going to dock you a lot because I'm not getting what I paid for. Alternatively, if the client said, Ethel, that's great. Ethel knows exactly what you know, so that's fine. Then there wouldn't be any problem in handing off the client. So this framework fits into a model of compensating differentials and provides the foundations for the cost of providing this amenity flexibility. Remember I began and I said that I've been misinterpreted as saying that firms should just impose flexibility. They have to be able to cut the cost. They cannot impose it. If the customers do not see these individuals as being good substitutes, then there's going to be a cost. So let's model it. Consider a very simple production process. On the vertical axis is product Q in dollar terms. On the horizontal axis is time, lambda units of time. So consider a production process such that, let's say, a formally trained employee, let's say a lawyer, person has a JD from a pretty good place, is in some position, let's call that position, position one, and let's say that's a large law firm, and that person has a value K1 per unit time. So that's just a line. Every unit of time the worker works, the worker produces K1 units. Very simple. But let's say that if the individual is not around, let's say the individual 
uh, is not around more than lambda 1 star hours, then the value declines, just like what happened with ethyl. I don't know ethyl from a can of beans. I'm going to dock you something. And here the penalty is this delta 1. And that gives the individual the following choice. If you work more than lambda star hours, you earn more per unit time. If you work less, you will earn less per unit time. But let's say that another position exists, as it does in law, and let's call that corporate counsel. That has a lower unit per value time, but it also has a lower penalty for not being around more than here lambda 2 star. So once again, even for corporate counsel, if you're not around all the time, you're worth somewhat less, but not a, not, not a lot less. And let's also say that there's a reservation position. Let's say a lawyer in government. And that lawyer in government has linear output with respect to hours work, and that gives us the green line. Under these conditions, the individual is faced with a nonlinear relationship between earnings and hours, where the nonlinearity depends upon the size of the penalty. If Ethel was just as good as I, as an accountant, then this would just be linear. If Ethel's really less good for some reason, then it would be very nonlinear. The implications of the framework suggests that nonlinearity arises when it's costly for employees to be away, when it's difficult to hand off clients, difficult, costly, when interdependent teams must coordinate schedules, such as in consulting, we would say we have five people on this team and everyone has to be here at the same time. Well, that causes problems if someone has to take their kid to the dentist at 11 and someone has to take they're a kid to the chiropractor at four. That's a problem. We have to coordinate schedules. And that is often a problem in financial occupations, con in consultancies, and for lawyers, and for accountants, for that matter. Linearity, on the other hand, arises when employees can substitute for each other in a more costless fashion, when there are many independent team members when information systems lower the cost of handing off clients, as we're going to see in a moment in the case of pharmacy. Uh, and also, in, uh, as I said, when there are independent team members. So when you go to a doctor nowadays, particularly in a large hospital, they will inform you how lucky you are to be in this large unit because your doctor, Dr. X, probably will not be around when you hurt yourself or get sick. But you're really lucky because even though you think Dr. X is great, Dr. X has a team, and that team of 20 people is going to support you until Dr. X gets around to figure out where in the emergency room or the hospital you are. If they can convince you of that, they have created linearities. Well, given the theory, then, what fundamental occupational characteristics should be related to this residual gender gap? That is, what is consistent with this theory? What will help us answer the big question that I pose? And I'm going to answer this two ways. The first one involves finding relevant characteristics for all of the three-digit occupations that I talked about. The source of those data is something called ONET. And ONET is the modern version of the Dictionary of Occupational Titles. It's online, it's produced by the Department of Labor, and it's very useful. And it's used by people who are interested, as students are, in what should I do with the rest of my life? Because it has about a thousand different, maybe even more, occupations in it. And it tells you exactly what is expected in these occupations by giving you hundreds of occupational characteristics. Some of these concern strength or cognitive abilities or other things that are just not relevant to the issues that I'm going to be discussing. <laughs> 
but some of them are relevant. And I selected characteristics from two groups. They're called work context and work activities. And I selected them about employee time pressure, whether employees need to be around and have what's called face time, whether they need to have client contact, whether these employees work independently on projects or on specific projects. And I normalize each characteristic to have zero mean standard deviation of one. And I produce the following table. And as you can see, so I've averaged each of these five characteristics, the five characteristics are given here. And I average them after I normalize them for each of the groups. And what you can see is that the technology and science occupations score much lower than the business and law. And that means there is less need in the science and the technology occupations to be around, less time pressure. Techies work on specific projects, and they work independently. This is pretty amazing that you can take these characteristics that were done for a completely different purpose and use them to gain insight into, for all these occupations, exactly why there are differences between men and women having to do with this framework, which has to do with the cost of temporal flexibility. And what I did here is I mapped on the horizontal axis the average of these normalized characteristics against the gender gap that I had produced before. And you can see, perhaps not surprisingly, there is a strong association between the average of the five scores and the gender pay gap. That gives us a lot of sense about what must be in the last chapter. What's going on is something about the characteristics of these occupations. So let's look at three occupations in detail. I'm going to begin with two that I suspect have large nonlinearities because they have very large gender gaps. One is the occupations that are held by MBAs, and the second is the occupations that are held by people with law degrees. So the second method explores individual occupations or degrees that lead to a set of positions, such as, the, as I did in the framework. So I've studied two that have among the largest gender gaps, business and finance, and also law. In each case, I'm going to use data that are very rich data. They are longitudinal data. They contain enormously rich information on the individuals and their productivity characteristics. The data for business come from the administrative records of the University of Chicago Booth School and also a survey of the MBAs from that school who graduated from 1990 to 2006. Now, in, that, in this work, and this comes from work that I've done with Marion Bertrand and Larry Katz, in this work, we found that the gender pay gap greatly increases with time since MBA. And on the horizontal axis is years since MBA. On the vertical axis, once again, is that gender gap that's the, uh, in long terms. So that 12 to 15 years after the MBA, it's about 56 log points and about 45 log points correcting for what I call MBA performance. That really means, did you take finance courses? How well did you do in them? But the largest factors in explaining the gender pay gap are hours and time out. And you can see that in the bracket that I'm giving there. Even though differences in hours are not very large, MBAs are working very long hours, so even small differences in hours matter a lot. Essentially what this means is that if someone is in iBanking or in management and they're working long hours and they have kids, they move into something like human resources where hours are shorter, or they go into self-employment where they can employ themselves and work shorter hours. <coughs> 
And it's also the case that time out in this group was also not very extensive, but the penalties were extremely large. So the conclusion that we came to in this article that we did on MBAs is that women with children shift into lower paying positions or to some small degree out of the labor force, and they do this to gain temporal flexibility. That is, the finance and the corporate sectors heavily penalize lower hours, and flexible hours are rather rare. Let me move to the JDs. For the JDs, I use the University of Michigan Law School Alumni Research data set. And that also contains exceptionally rich data on hours and earnings and family and all sorts of life transitions for individuals who received a JD from the University of Michigan Law School. The relationship between the gender earnings gap and time since JD is very similar to this picture for MBAs, so I won't waste time on it. Instead, what I want to do is show the graph between annual earnings in four weekly hours bins 15 years after receiving a JD for men and women leaving law school from 1982 to 1991. And this is all in real terms, so we don't have to worry about price level fluctuations. This is really very simple, not rocket science. Earnings here, you can see, are clearly nonlinear with regard to weekly hours. You work more hours, and you're getting more per hour. Now, it's also the case, so here, those working more weekly hours earn more on an hourly basis. And this exercise stands up to various controls for years off, for years part time, and also even within males and within females. It's also the case that uh, those who work fewer hours, far greater fraction female. So you can see that the, uh, the fraction female goes down as weekly hours um, increases. And conditional on being female, the fraction with children also goes up as hours decrease. Now, not surprisingly, hourly fees are reported by many lawyers. Anyone who's ever hired a lawyer knows that they not only know their hourly fee, they know their fee for, for every 15 minutes. <laughs> so we can also do this for hourly fees. And as you can see, the hourly fee also rises with weekly hours. So those who work Longer hours have higher hourly fees. So it's pretty clear for the work on MBAs and for JDs that there are, for these occupations that we saw that the gender gaps were very large, there are nonlinearities. We can find these nonlinearities. Let me move to my last example, which is a high income occupation in with a very small gender gap, and that is pharmacy. And you can see here, this is pharmacy. You can count the number, this is for men, you can see that it is the eighth highest paying occupation for men, okay? It's the fourth highest paid occupation for women. This is full time year round. I hope that this gives you more respect when you go see your pharmacist, the next time you see your pharmacist. Your pharmacist is a very high paid worker. <coughs> now, pharmacy has undergone very large changes over the past 50 years. Ownership and the fraction working in independent practice, which is the blue line, has plummeted. Chances are almost all of you go to a pharmacy that is owned by a large corporation. I happen to go to an independent pharmacy in Cambridge, Massachusetts, but I bet that none of you do. The fraction female, which is the red line, has risen, and the ratio of female to male earnings, which is the green line, has also increased. 
Most pharmacists today are employees. They work for large firms. They work in hospitals. They work in mail order. The spread of vast information systems and the standardization of drugs have enhanced the ability of pharmacists to hand off clients costlessly. How many people here have ever been to a pharmacy? Very good. How many people here, when you go to a pharmacy, say, I want ethyl or I want so-and-so? Probably no one, because you're pretty much assured that the pharmacist who gives you your prescription has done it right and knows a lot about you. And one of the reasons they know a lot about you is they have a computer in front of them. They know, believe it or not, all the prescriptions you have ever received, even if you didn't receive them there, because they're connected to your insurer's information, OK? And so therefore, they're very important as a first line of defense so that we don't take medications that are counterindicated by something or that conflict with something, OK? But the result is that they're very good substitutes for each other because they have lots of information there and because the drugs and products are pretty standardized and because they're pretty smart people. The result is that short or irregular hours are not penalized. Pay is almost perfectly linear in hours. Those who work lower hours, say because of family, are paid less linearly. And those who work more because their managers are paid more linearly. Part-time work is very extensive in pharmacy. You can see here that particularly among women, a very large fraction work under 35 hours a week. But there is almost no part-time wage penalty in pharmacy. And uh, the best way of seeing that is the first column uses data on hourly earnings. Uh, as given by the individual, they say how much they earn per hour. And there is no relationship between that and the part-time dummy. OK, so we now know what must be in the last chapter for it to be the last. It must contain considerable economic change and not just be a Band-Aid with firms offering flexible work at bargain prices. It can't just be that firms wave a little banner and say, we're all for family-friendly policies. Temporal flexibility must become less expensive to workers. There must be more linearity and less nonlinearity of earnings with respect to hours. A restructuring of jobs has happened organically in many occupations, such as, as you see here, in pharmacy, physicians, optometrists, and veterinarians. Certain physician specialties have lower hours. In fact, 36% of all female pediatricians work under 35 hours a week. Some of them have few on-call hours. And those that have planned procedures also have greater temporal flexibility. Many of the tech and the science occupations have built-in flexibility because the projects are often independently done, not interdependently done. And the spread of information systems has led to change in many other sectors. The previous metaphorical chapters of the grand gender convergence have concerned, as I said, the relative increase of human capital attributes of women, that is, greater education, greater job experience, tenure on the job. But the last chapter will not be about changing productive attributes. The last chapter has to concern the utilization and remuneration of existing productive attributes. It's going to be about firm response to changes in technology and the changing preferences of employees. It's going to be about how workers sort among positions and about declining compensating differentials an endogenous job design. But most important, the last chapter isn't just about women. The last chapter isn't just a woman's problem. 
because it isn't a zero-sum game. And the changes that I've described can better most everyone's life. Thanks very much.